Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named Dexter, Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a man gently gliding a scalpel across a body's cheek. It is the first cut of the Grim Reaper, collecting a drop of blood as a souvenir. The roaring chainsaw that follows is the howl of death, dismembering the body before sinking it into the sea to destroy the evidence. The Grim Reaper in this drama is named Dexter, who specializes in punishing those criminals who have managed to evade the law in his own way. So far, many criminals have died at his hands. The man he kidnapped and killed just yesterday was a respectable middle school principal on the surface, but he was secretly a child murderer. After evading the law for over a decade, it took a lot of effort from Dexter to expose and bring the school principal to justice, allowing him to repent before sending him off to hell. Interestingly, Dexter, a serial killer himself, is a blood splatter analyst working in the Miami Metro Police Department. He can deduce the modus operandi of the killer through the blood traces at the crime scene. This job helps Dexter perfectly hide his true identity. One day, another serial murder case occurs at the police station. They discover a body in a hotel swimming pool. Upon seeing the body, Dexter, usually as steady as a rock, is shocked. The body is dismembered, yet there is not a drop of blood at the scene. He has never seen such a clean and neatly arranged body, which is like a work of art in his eyes. However, the thorough cleaning of the blood left Dexter unable to think. He could only picture the act of murder and, unable to control himself, left the scene in deep thoughts. When he got home, his contract girlfriend Rita was already waiting for him. Since he wasn't particularly interested in women, he had chosen a contract girlfriend to hide his true self. They have been dating for over half a year but haven't even kissed using their juicy tongues. However, they would go out on dates like any other ordinary couple. At that moment, Dexter noticed flashing police lights at the end of the street. His intuition told him he would be on duty overtime. Sure enough, after pushing through the crowd, another clean body was found, with no trace of blood at the scene. The only difference was that this body was headless. Dexter realized it was the work of the same killer, who clearly had no intention of stopping. Based on the time the bodies were found, Dexter deduced that the killer must have several more dismembered bodies hidden away, as such perfect works of art would take quite some time to create. Yet the killer had dumped two bodies in just two days. In the car, Dexter described the body to Rita, describing the killer as an artist. As he grew more and more excited, he unconsciously reached towards Rita's sensitive thigh, but Rita avoided him, saying that she was not ready. The next day, Dexter proposed his theory to his sister Deborah, who was also a police officer. He saw the body had been frozen, leading him to believe that the killer must own a ice truck. Otherwise, it would be impossible to leave no trace while draining the blood. Dexter requested the police to investigate stolen ice trucks while he continued his hunt. That night, Dexter trailed a criminal, another beast who killed the innocent. He brought him down in an abandoned warehouse, then dismembered him in the same way. If he didn't kill every night, he would feel uneasy. However, on the way back, an ice truck passed by him. His sharp instincts were triggered. It was off work hours, and the truck in the wilderness was highly suspicious. Dexter had no choice but to follow it secretly. However, after crossing a bridge, the truck turned around, heading straight for Dexter, and threw out something like a human head. Soon, the police took over the scene because what the ice truck had thrown out was nothing other than the missing head from the previous body. Dexter returned home somewhat panicked, only to find a doll's head hanging on his fridge. Excited yet anticipative, Dexter opened the fridge to find a dismembered doll inside. It was evident that the killer had broken into Dexter's house and seemed to have discovered his secret identity as a serial killer. Yet he didn't feel a shred of panic, but was incredibly excited. This was the opponent he had longed for, and their communication was through these dismembered bodies. The next day, Dexter received a call from Deborah. The police had found the ice truck he'd spoken of. The vehicle was parked at the roadside, engine still running, but the driver was nowhere to be found. It was as if the killer had deliberately left it for the police. Upon opening it, they discovered five frozen fingers, devoid of any blood. However, the fingerprints could easily identify the victims. Dexter couldn't wait to have the fingers tested. He wasn't interested in the identities of the deceased, but wanted to know what message the killer was trying to convey to him. Unfortunately, Dexter was still in the dark about the ice truck killer. He was a worthy opponent. In his free time, Dexter had dinner with his girlfriend. However, there were too many murderers in the U.S. and Dexter would never miss a hunting opportunity. He made an excuse to follow a man into the restroom. The scene shifts abruptly. 
The man finds himself bound inside Dexter's secret chamber. As confusion crosses his face, Dexter provides the answer. The man had once drunk-driven, killing an innocent mother. He had shattered a family, yet faced no punishment. Dexter, in his own way, put an end to the man's sinful life. His collection had gained another life. After dealing with the body, Dexter returned home, only to find the ice truck killer had visited once again. This time, the killer had taken the doll from his fridge, seemingly to provoke Dexter into seeking the killer out. Before long, the killer's first gift appeared, a man with his left foot severed. The killer seemed to know of Dexter's bloodthirst, inviting him to dismember the present before him. Staring at the vulnerable prey before him, his calm and deep-set eyes contemplated what to do. At that moment, the flash of a camera light from the window caught his attention. This was undoubtedly a gift he'd never receive in his lifetime. The man had been blindfolded, one foot sawn off, and neat sets of knives were laid out beside him. It was as if the killer were inviting Dexter to play a game of dismemberment. Such a gift was indeed very tempting to Dexter, but the killer had made a mistake. Though Dexter's hands were stained with blood, those he killed were all heinous criminals. He would never kill an innocent person. However, the gift-giving killer didn't seem to plan on letting him go, snapping a picture of Dexter with the man. The killer's every move targeted Dexter, yet they stayed hidden, prolonging this cat-and-mouse game. It was time to end it. Dexter was determined to draw out the hiding killer. After leaving the scene, Deborah quickly received an address from Dexter. Using it, she managed to rescue the gift-wrapped man from the warehouse. The poor man was still a gift, only this time it was a gift from Dexter to Deborah to gain credit. The next day, a dismembered woman's body appeared in the ice rink, bearing the signature modus operandi of the ice truck killer. The woman's severed arm was missing five fingers, obviously the owner of the fingers found in the truck. The police reviewed the surveillance footage and found clear visuals of a security guard moving the body. Eager to solve the case, the police chief immediately identified the security guard as the killer. But would such a careful killer leave such an obvious clue? Deborah and her colleagues repeatedly reviewed the video and finally noticed the issue. The security guard kept looking back while moving the body, as if someone off camera was instructing him. She was about to report her findings to the police chief, but the chief had already held a press conference, pinning the label of the ice truck killer on the security guard. The very next day, they found the security guard's severed hand on the beach. From being the perpetrator to becoming a victim, this investigative result caused an uproar. The police became a laughing stock. Yet, a photo was left at the scene, a scene that Dexter found all too familiar. Obviously, the killer was once again communicating with Dexter through his crimes. Dexter, filled with doubts, immediately returned home. After taking out his photo album, everything was as he suspected. As it turned out, Dexter had visited this beach with his foster family when he was a child. This realization sent chills down his spine. This indicated that the killer knew Dexter all too well, like a familiar stranger lurking in the shadows, intermittently revealing themselves. This feeling deeply unsettled Dexter. Yet he was confirmed that if the killer made a move, they would inevitably leave clues behind. Dexter then pulled out all the pictures of him with his foster father, and sure enough, he found that the crime scenes matched the locations in the photos. He took out a photo of himself as a child, a place he used to frequent often. However, when he arrived there, the place had changed dramatically. Just then, he spotted a head in a distant pile of grass. An ominous feeling surged as he cautiously approached. It turned out to be an old man sleeping in the grass. While Dexter was investigating, the police weren't idle either. The man with the severed leg, who had been rescued earlier, finally woke up. He said his eyes were covered at the time, and fear made him ignore everything around him. To help him recall the details of the incident, Deborah recreated the scene using a tie. After a painful journey down memory lane, the man finally remembered a clue, the sound of a mint candy wrapper being crumbled. Based on this detail, the police found a wrapper in a rat's nest at the crime scene. The following testing revealed partial fingerprints on it, likely left by the ice truck killer. This finding caused everyone to cheer, but all this was of no interest to Dexter, who had just gotten off work and had already targeted a new prey. This new prey was a local human trafficker, but Dexter's investigation revealed that he was smuggling people under the guise of human trafficking, but was actually killing and stealing goods. The ship's cabin was filled with hapless victims, all dead. Dexter planned to punish him in his own way. After setting a simple trap in a container, he easily lured the trafficker in. Just as Dexter was pronouncing the death sentence, there was a sudden noise outside. It turned out to be the trafficker's girlfriend. 
Dexter observed her every move from the shadows and noticed her pulling out a gun. He immediately understood that the girlfriend was also involved in the crime. Deciding to be thorough, he planned to send both to their demise. After completing the killing process, the trafficker and his girlfriend were dismembered into onion pieces and bagged. Dexter's collection gained two more lives. As he was leaving, Dexter didn't notice that a pair of eyes in the trunk of an abandoned car had recorded everything he had done. When the first domino falls, what follows is a flood of calamities. Dexter never imagined that the police would find the girlfriend of the trafficker he had discarded. Even though he was confident that he had left no trace, his habitual injections of sedatives could expose him at any time. What was even more unexpected was that a little boy was found in the car's trunk. The boy had witnessed the entire case unfold, and the police chief was already preparing to have the boy do a sketch reconstruction. Dexter panicked upon realizing these happenings. He rushed to the crime scene without a second thought and dived into the trunk of the car to test what the boy could have seen. Then he saw the little boy's sight fell directly on his face. He now knew he was in a predicament. Either of these clues could land him in prison at any moment. To be on the safe side, Dexter packed up all his tools of crime that night and threw them into the ocean. He then reluctantly took out his collection memories of all these years. He opened each one, savoring the moments for the last time. Vivid memories of the past immediately sprang to mind. However, when he picked up the last piece, a smiley face appeared on it. Dexter was terrified at the thought. It seemed that all of this was a trap set by the ice truck killer, probably to see how Dexter would escape from his predicament. The adversary's plot was too powerful. Dexter had unknowingly walked into the trap, but he couldn't afford to investigate the identity of the ice truck killer now. His priority was to extricate himself from the current crisis. The next day, Dexter got to the medical examiner's computer before anyone else and secretly deleted his tranquilizer purchase records. But when Dexter went to the scene to work, the result of the boy's sketch reconstruction was already out, showing the actual killer who had executed the man and woman. Right then, all eyes were on Dexter, who was extremely panicked but tried to compose himself. He had already prepared for the worst. If necessary, he would become a fugitive. But it turned out the sketch his colleague revealed was of a man with long hair resembling the image of Jesus. Dexter finally relaxed and couldn't help but laugh out loud. But he still had doubts, wondering why the boy's description failed to match him. Perhaps only the ice truck killer knew the answer to this question. But the police couldn't care less. As all the current leads had been cut off and the deceased were guilty as charged, they put all their energy back into the case of the ice truck killer. After all, this was the most pressing case for the police. This is the main reason why Dexter could get away every time he committed a crime. As long as he only killed those who were extremely guilty, the police would not investigate too thoroughly. Back to the case of the ice truck killer, the efficiency of Deborah was as impressive as always. By tirelessly reviewing the surveillance footage from all the crime scenes, she finally identified a suspicious man named Neil. He had appeared near the crime scenes twice, and according to criminal psychology, there's a high probability that a murderer will return to the scene of the crime to admire his work and observe the police's actions. Having finally found a suspect, Deborah wasted no time in going for the arrest. To prevent Neil from escaping, Deborah and her team surrounded the front and back entrances of his residence. Unexpectedly, Neil, as crafty as a fox, had a side door which he used to sneak out, puncture the tires of their car, and escape. Upon discovering this, Deborah immediately initiated a pursuit, but they could only watch as Neil drove away. Although Neil had escaped, his behavior was highly suspicious. Even if he wasn't the killer, he must have been involved in some Something shady. The police immediately issued a warrant for his arrest and then searched Neil's residence. Much to their shock, they found a large number of animal specimens inside, along with a lot of information on dismembering human bodies on his computer and photos from the crime scenes. This evidence strongly suggested that Neil was the ice truck killer. However, Dexter disagreed with this conclusion. Because he and the ice truck killer were of the same kind, only a murderer would understand another murderer best. Neil had merely collected some roadkill. His behavior was hardly comparable to theirs. But the next moment, the police found a skeleton of an adult woman in the yard outside with the left leg neatly cut off. This compelling evidence silenced Dexter. Deborah speculated that this was Neil's first murder, hence why he kept the body as a collectible. 
The police then performed an autopsy on the body and soon found out that it was Neil's mother. She was a drunkard with a severe tendency towards violence, often beating Neil when she got drunk. Deborah guessed that one day, in a fit of rage from the abuse, Neil impulsively killed his mother, triggering his murderous tendencies and turning him into the serial killer in the ice truck case. This theory aligned with all the evidence pointing to Neil as the ice truck killer. With all the police force in pursuit of Neil, they finally pinpointed his location thanks to the tip-off from a motel landlady. At this time, Neil had no clue about what was going on. He was in a room tying up a girl when the police suddenly appeared behind him and arrested him. During the interrogation, Neil straightforwardly confesses that he is the ice truck killer. He describes the details of refrigeration and dismemberment as if he had really done it. Everyone at the police station was overjoyed, but Dexter's face was grave. He knew that Neil was not the murderer, but he didn't understand why Neil would confess. The one who communicated with him through the bodies, who drew a smiley face in his collection, was definitely not the fool in front of him. There must be some important clues overlooked. So, Dexter seized the opportunity to test Neil and closely observed his behaviors. But after their short interaction, Dexter seemed to have gotten the answer he wanted. He was even a bit relieved that the mysterious ally or enemy in the dark was not this fool. Since the police had closed the case, the search for the ice truck killer was now solely on Dexter. Since all the victims were sex workers, Dexter used Barbie's username online, posing as a charming girl trying to lure out the murderer. So you'll never know if the sexy girl chatting with you now is actually a creepy old keyboard warrior with a smelly beard. Although it was like finding a needle in a haystack, Dexter had no other good ideas because the ice truck killer had been quiet for some time. The scene then changes to Dexter's girlfriend Rita, who is driving to pick up her child from school. But the school security says the child has already been picked up by their father. Rita is stunned. It turns out her ex-husband was released from prison today, and they were still fighting for custody of the child. Rita hates her ex-husband, a domestic abuser who wants to take her child after being released from prison. She complains to Dexter that she wants to leave her ex-husband and get him to disappear forever. Dexter decides to help Rita. That night, her ex-husband is preparing to party at home when a shadow flashes by the window. He carefully gets up and goes to the door. This is a syringe that has witnessed numerous terrifying scenes. It has accompanied its owner in dissecting over 100 heinous murderers, and today it was this man's turn. To make someone disappear, killing is not the only way. Dexter, who only kills the guilty, cannot kill Rita's ex-husband, but he can think of dozens of ways to put him in jail for life. After Dexter simply stages a drug scene, the police quickly arrest the ex-husband based on a tip-off. The next day, Rita receives the news that her ex-husband has been arrested and jailed. She cries tears of joy and hugs Dexter tightly, not knowing that all of this was done by Dexter for her. But Dexter is not feeling well. A live man is in front of him, but he cannot kill. His craving for blood makes Dexter dig out his next target. The man is a beastly psychologist whose patients keep committing suicide. Although the police did not suspect the psychologist, it didn't escape Dexter's eyes. The psychologist has been using drugs and psychology to manipulate his patients into killing themselves. His secret murdering method has kept him out of the law. Dexter pretends to be a patient and thanks the psychologist after some psychological counseling. Then he reveals the secret buried deep in his heart that he is actually a serial killer. The psychologist thought Dexter was joking, but the next second, he was kidnapped and lying in Dexter's slaughterhouse. As usual, Dexter first accused the psychologist of his crimes, then sliced his face to collect souvenirs. The buzzing of the live chainsaw was like the roar of the Grim Reaper. Dexter had repeated this process at least 100 times, but he never felt tired. He really enjoyed the feeling of killing. Just as Dexter was indulging his desires, the long-absent ice truck killer made a new move. A man received Dexter's phishing message on his computer. In the man's ambivalent reply, it seemed like he knew that the person on the other side of the computer was Dexter. The headless doll next to the mouse was a harbinger that he was the legendary ice truck killer. He was waiting for an opportunity, an opportunity to confront Dexter face to face. Soon, Dexter received a parcel. The letter said his biological father had passed away and left him a mansion, hoping he could handle the inheritance procedures now. But Dexter's stepfather said his biological father had died in a car accident 10 years ago. So, who was this man? To find out the truth, Dexter decided to investigate over the weekend, taking Rita for a holiday. It was their first trip since they confirmed their relationship, but as they arrived at the mansion, a knock on the door sounded. To his surprise, his sister Deborah showed up and introduced to him her new boyfriend named Rudy, who claimed to be a doctor. 
Unexpectedly, the ice truck killer had become the boyfriend of Deborah. The two killers finally met, but Dexter did not yet know that Rudy, the man in front of him, was the one he had been looking for. The next morning, Dexter, accustomed to being alone, went to the hospital to claim his biological father's body. Looking at the unfamiliar corpse, Dexter still felt very surreal. His stepfather had said his biological father had been dead for more than 10 years, but now he suddenly appeared. But the moment Dexter saw the tattoo on his biological father's hand, a childhood image flashed in his mind. He was very sure he had seen this tattoo before. To further confirm the relationship, Dexter prepared their blood samples and sent them to the medical examiner to help with a DNA test. Unexpectedly, the DNA was a complete match. Dexter fell into deep thought. He didn't understand why his stepfather had lied to him, but the news the medical examiner gave him next was even more shocking. Because his biological father's blood sample contained tranquilizers, it was very likely that his death was a murder. To clear his doubts, Dexter snuck into the hospital that night, planning to investigate the cause of death of the corpse. But unexpectedly, the corpse had already been cremated by the hospital, and now only a small urn was left. The mysterious death of his biological father reminded him of his own mother. When he was three years old, he had witnessed his mother being dismembered. The splattering blood painted the entire room red. Facing his dying mother and the clueless Dexter, the sound of crying mixed with the buzzing of the chainsaw and the splattering of blood was like hell. Upon returning, Dexter poured over a vast amount of information. No matter if it was newspapers, archives, or the internet, there was no information about the tragedy from that year. Subsequently, Dexter, filled with questions, sought out the police station's archivist. All along, it was this archivist who had been secretly providing Dexter with criminal records. But she claimed that the records were destroyed on the day Dexter was adopted. Clearly, Dexter wasn't able to get the answers he sought. Disheartened, he sold the house his biological father had left him, returned to work suppressing his many questions. However, recalling his mother's death was like a curse. It felt like a pair of invisible hands were guiding Dexter, forcing him to relive his painful past. The police's recent discovery of a murder case was a critical piece of the puzzle. The killer had the audacity to send a jar of human blood to the police station, also including a hotel room number. As the top blood expert, Dexter, fully equipped, walked into this carefully arranged room, only to see a room decorated with blood. The strong smell of blood could even numb one's sense of smell. The killer used the blood of five people to create an ultimate gift just to give to Dexter on Christmas. His soul was hit hard because this room was exactly the same as when he was three years old. His mother was dismembered in front of him. The sealed memory was opened, and Dexter felt an unprecedented fear. He suddenly became breathless, stumbling out of the room. This was a gift prepared for him by the ice truck killer. The goal was to help him recover his memory. No wonder the previous victims were drained of blood, waiting for this day to knock Dexter out with a big move. But the more the killer did, the more mistakes would be exposed. Elsewhere in a nightclub, an officer was suddenly attracted by a call girl's prosthetic hand. The color of the nails reminded him instantly of the ice truck killer. A victim's finger had been chopped off and painted just like this. The girl said that a handsome customer painted it for her a year ago. The man was obsessively fascinated with her prosthetic limb, but after that time, the customer never sought her again. The officer immediately lost interest in staying at the nightclub. He hurried back to the police station to tell the medical examiner about his findings. Unfortunately, the medical examiner didn't know much about prosthetics and recommended that the officer ask Dr. Rudy. Soon after, the officer found Rudy. Rudy thought the officer had discovered something and was ready to take action with a knife at any time. But in the end, he found that the officer didn't suspect him at all. However, the clue that the officer had was still a big threat to him. That night, as soon as the officer returned home, he was attacked. A man in black stabbed the officer in the back. Fortunately, the officer saw this scene in the reflection of the car window and reacted in time to avoid a fatal blow. A muscular man from the nearby gym came to his aid, and the man in black had to abandon his attack and flee for his shitty life. Afterward, the failed Rudy changed his target. He found the prosthetic girl and with a little money tricked her into his home. In the midst of an ambiguous atmosphere, he strangled her sexy body from behind. The next day, the girl's body was found at the entrance of the mall. Her body was not only dismembered, but was also wrapped up like a Christmas present. This case once again put the police in the spotlight.
Previously, they had claimed to have caught the ice truck killer, but now the perpetrator had struck again, contradicting the police's former conclusions. Upon returning, Dexter carefully examined the clothes the officer was wearing when he was injured. In addition to the fresh blood from the assailant's attack, Dexter discovered a drop of blood that didn't belong to the officer through careful observation. He suspected that the killer might have been injured at the time. However, this was only his guess and would only be confirmed after testing. At this time, Deborah told Rudy that she was supposed to go on a date after work today, but because of the day's events, it was canceled. During their chat, Dexter noticed a wound on Rudy's lip, which Rudy explained happened by accident at work. Dexter didn't think too much of it at the time. He liked Rudy and hoped he and Deborah could have a good outcome. After returning, Dexter started investigating the clues the killer left for him. Just as the officer was waking up in the hospital, Dexter found him and closely examined the back of his head. Surprisingly, there was a row of bite marks. The officer said it must have been left by the attacker during his resistance. This discovery sent chills down Dexter's spine. He quickly asked the officer who he had seen before the incident, and the officer said it's Rudy. This answer made Dexter begin to suspect Rudy, because Rudy's lip was recently injured. Before, he had found the blood trace of the killer on the officer's clothes. Now, just by getting Rudy's DNA, all the speculations would become reality. So he took advantage of the night to come to Rudy's house. At this time, Rudy should have been on a date with Deborah, but the custom-made door lock made him stop in his tracks. There was also a surveillance camera, and he would definitely be discovered if he entered rashly. But Dexter had his ways. The next second, he jumped into the nearby garbage bin. Not long after, he found a blood-stained cotton ball in it. Meanwhile, Rudy knelt on one knee and proposed to Deborah, but the ring was actually taken from a dead person's hand. This jerk didn't even want to spend money to buy one. Deborah, however, was blinded by love, picked up the champagne and drank it all at once. But Rudy didn't drink, smiling slyly. At that moment, she finally noticed the mint candy wrapper on the table, and a bad premonition surged in her. On Dexter's end, the blood on the cotton ball and the comparison results with the blood on the officer's clothes finally came out. The two samples completely matched. By the time Dexter realized Deborah was in danger, it was already too late. Rudy had disappeared, taking her somewhere unknown. Given the past habits of the ice truck killer, Dexter suspected Rudy may have left clues at his own home. After a thorough search, Dexter noticed his own computer screensaver. It's a picture of a shipping container. The horrific dismemberment of his mother had taken place inside one just like it. A sense of dread washed over him, making him realize this was the clue Rudy had left for him. But the docks were filled with thousands of containers. Finding the one where his mother was murdered was like finding a needle in a haystack. Without any choice, he carefully reviewed the cases and newspapers he'd collected over the years. Finally, he found a clue on a photo, a container with the number 3489. Just then, the police chief and Officer James showed up. They realized Deborah hadn't shown up for work, and her phone was unreachable. Furthermore, Dexter had secretly requested a blood test in the lab the night before. James felt Dexter was definitely hiding the truth. Under their questioning, Dexter revealed that Rudy was the ice truck killer. James was furious, accusing Dexter of withholding the truth and potentially endangering Deborah's life. The police then organized a city-wide manhunt. However, Dexter once again withheld the clue about the container. Guided by the number, he found the container from the horrific case. At the age of three, he was rescued by his stepfather from a bloodbath inside. Dexter couldn't believe his guess was wrong. At that moment, Officer James walked out. He had realized that Dexter must have withheld some clues, so he followed him here. James was disgusted by Dexter's lies. It wasn't until the dock manager showed up that the two stopped their fight. Simultaneously, they received a message that the police had used a search warrant to raid Rudy's residence. Under the disguise of a doctor, Rudy was hiding a gruesome dissection lab. In comparison to Dexter's makeshift slaughterhouse, this place was like a luxury suite. The human-shaped dolls scattered around made Dexter thoughtful. They were the props his mother used to tell stories when he was a child. James, however, saw all this and still didn't let go of his suspicions about Dexter. Dexter returned to his mother's residence, the place where he was born and grew up. Memories of playing hide-and-seek with his mother and his brother, Brian, came flooding back to his mind. Suddenly, Rudy walked out of the house, leaving Dexter stunned. It turned out the ice truck killer had always been his own brother. The scene of their mother's dismemberment when they were children, Brian was there too. They spent a long two-day nightmare in a pool of blood. 
Dexter was young then, able to bury the memories deep within. But the older Brian would never forget that tragic scene. They had shared that experience, and both turned into serial killers. They were essentially the same kind of people. Brian wanted to join forces with Dexter to help Dexter unleash his inherent nature. The two brothers walked to the nearby warehouse. Brian tied up Deborah in the way Dexter liked the most. He wanted to dismember her with Dexter. Only by killing Deborah could Dexter find his true self. But this contradicted Dexter's principle, and besides, Deborah was their stepfather's daughter, Dexter's half sister. As he hesitated, Brian instantly reached for a knife, intending to strike first. Fortunately, Dexter's quick reflexes stopped him. The two immediately started wrestling their muscles. At the crucial moment, sirens blared. James followed in hot pursuit, but Brian had already escaped through a secret passage. Thankfully, Deborah wasn't seriously injured. However, Officer James was suspicious of Dexter's presence there. Dexter could only claim that Brian had summoned him and warned him not to call the police. Otherwise, Deborah would be killed. But James didn't believe Dexter's tale. He was convinced that Dexter was hiding a secret. However, Deborah got furious, claiming that her brother just saved her life. Deborah was nearly killed by her fiance. Her heart was more wounded than her body. Afterwards, Dexter took Deborah to his house to take care of her while he slept in the living room outside. In the middle of the night, the door lock was suddenly opened. Brian, who had returned, still hadn't given up on killing Deborah. He glanced at the sleeping Dexter and without a word, swung a knife at Deborah. However, upon a strike, Brian realized that it was a trap. He was then strangled by Dexter from the back and suffocated. He should have expected Dexter's attack. Dexter brought Brian to the slaughterhouse he had built himself, using tools stolen from the police station that Brian had originally used to commit his crimes. Dexter pressed his head against Brian's. This was the first time he thought about sparing someone, but at the same time, it was someone he had to kill. So this is what heartache feels like. Dexter personally killed the last of his kin in this world. He felt an unprecedented loneliness watching his brother's blood drain away. A few days later, the police found Brian's body, but Dexter had already arranged the scene to look like a suicide. That's why he didn't choose to dismember the body this time. The long, troubling ice truck killer case ended in this manner. Dexter handled everything and returned to his girlfriend's side. Now, everyone who knew his secret was dead and everything returned to normal. He continued his lifestyle, killing a few criminals when there's nothing to do, then coming home to a warm meal. But James still suspected Dexter. In the upcoming hunt, he must take actions more cautiously. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.